Now, anyone who's into motorsport and racing would know that one of the problems is making sure your race car is still going. Right now, our Nissan 350Z is undergoing an engine swap and so that we could still continue to compete in race meetings as well as punch out course and webinar material, we took ownership of this 86 in the meantime. In brief, the car has been fitted with a race-built Toyota 1UZFE VVTi engine that's now producing around about 450 flywheel horsepower. It's backed up with a twin plate clutch and a Toyota R154 gearbox, feeding power back to a Cusco clutch plate LSD in the rear and drive shaft shop axles. The suspension's also been totally overhauled with a set of MCA coilovers and it's running a set of endless brakes on the front. So, all things considered, it's a pretty well sorted package. Now this car is actually no stranger to the HPA workshop. We've been heavily involved in this car for the last owner, specifically with the electronics package the wiring and the tuning. We covered this in a series on our YouTube channel. You can follow the link in the description if you want to learn more. When the car came up for sale from the last owner, it was a natural progression that we took over ownership and continued the development. As is common with just about any car project, once we started beating up on this car on the racetrack, we found a few more areas that still required some work. Specifically, this was around the cooling package on the car. The first problem we found was that even after four or five hard laps around our local racetrack, the engine coolant temperature started to soar, and we were seeing temperatures in the 105 to 106 degree C vicinity, certainly a little bit hotter than what we'd be comfortable with. This was actually even more problematic though because the very first event that we wanted to do in the car was a one hour endurance meeting. Given that we were struggling to do more than four or five laps in anger, it was unlikely the car was going to perform well over a full hour. What we actually found is that despite the band-aid fixes that we applied to try and get through the race meeting and even short shifting the engine at 7,000 RPM instead of the 8,600 RPM red line, we still saw temperatures climb. We were circulating at around about 108 to 110 degrees C and under a safety car period we saw temperatures soar to 116. This is something we definitely need to do some serious work on. Another issue we highlighted when we were testing for our endurance meeting was that the rear diff really needed an oil cooler. After around 15 or 16 hard laps, the diff oil was getting so hot that it was blowing out of the diff breather, landing on the exhaust, and at one point we were fearful the car was actually going to catch fire. Now, we didn't have the opportunity to fit a diff cooler prior to our race meeting, so we applied some Kiwi Ingenuity with a band-aid fix. We extended the diff breather up into the boot compartment and we added a catch can. Now, while this doesn't fix the overheating oil, and it's certainly not a long-term solution, it did help get us through that race meeting. Despite our obvious problems keeping the engine temperature under control, the car's cooling system has seen a fairly thorough revision. There's a much larger aluminium radiator fitted which on paper should be more than adequate to cool 500 plus brake horsepower. Likewise, a large oil cooler has been fitted to the front of the car. Now, while on paper the components fitted to the car should be more than up to the task, often where we can run into trouble is the way these are installed in the car and also the way the air flows in and out of those coolers. The first and probably most obvious issue that we're going to address is the fact that currently the large oil cooler is fitted directly in front of the radiator. Now, at operating temperature, it's likely that the air coming off the back of that oil cooler and then progressing through the radiator could easily be in the vicinity of 90 to 100 degrees. Clearly, that's not going to be helping the radiator's task of getting rid of heat out of the water. So we're going to be removing that oil cooler and fitting it into the left-hand front corner of the bumper and we're going to be venting air through it and then out through the inner fender. In the same vein, the air intake that's currently fitted to the car blocks the top portion of the radiator, so we're going to be removing this in favour of a pod style air filter. We've also had a chat to the guys at PWR in Australia, we've given them some information about the system and they've uncovered a potential technical issue with the installation relating to the two dash 6 bleed lines that run from the water inlet and outlet on the engine up to the radiator header tank or expansion tank. So we're going to be addressing these as part of our modifications too. 
So at this stage, once we've got these relatively minor modifications made to the cooling system, we're going to be heading back to the track and trying to prove that the cooling system is now able to keep up. We do have a suspicion that we're still going to strike problems. We're no strangers to the Toyota 86, and our other turbocharged Toyota 86 has also given us no end of cooling problems. While we're not 100% certain of this, one of our suspicions is that one of the issues with the Toyota 86 is the airflow out of the engine bay. It's all well and good getting airflow into the radiator, but if it can't flow out the back of the radiator and out of the engine bay, we're going to end up with limited airflow through the radiator core and this will affect the radiator core's ability to do its job. With this in mind, if our initial modifications aren't effective in getting the car to stay cool, the other option we are investigating is venting the air from the back of the radiator out through the top of the bonnet. modifications made to our cooling system it was finally time to head to Highlands Motorsport Park and see if the modifications we've made actually work. Now in the midst of making changes to our cooling system we've also added a six speed sequential gearbox and we've added a temperature sensor to the gearbox as well just so we can see what's happening with the gearbox oil temperature. We've headed out onto the track and put in around about 20 laps and so far the news is both good and not so good. Let's start with the good and the first thing I would notice is that our engine coolant temperature is now staying under control. Previously we were seeing temperatures well in excess of 110 degrees C which is pretty scary stuff. After 20 hard laps we're still seeing the engine coolant temperature sit between about 84 and 88 degrees and we're much happier with that but the other thing that's important to take away from the data is that the coolant temperature is staying stable. In fact it's tending to oscillate slightly up and down depending on how much load the car is put under at the time. We can't consider the engine coolant temperature on its own though. The engine coolant temperature and the engine oil temperature both kind of affect each other. So looking at our oil temperature the news is not quite so good. What we're seeing is that over the course of our sessions out on the track the oil temperature is staying under control. We're seeing a maximum of about 102 degrees which is definitely nothing to worry about with a good quality synthetic oil. This 
slightly worrying aspect though is we are seeing a gradual trend for the oil temperature to creep up lap after lap. Now this would suggest that possibly in a longer race the oil cooler may not quite be sufficient so we may need to address this particularly given that we want to race this car in endurance racing events ranging from one to three hours. So definitely we want to make sure that our oil temperature can stay under control over a long duration. Moving to the rear of the car, the news when it comes to our diff oil temperature is not quite so good. Over the course of our track testing we managed to get the diff oil temperature up to 128 degrees C. Now that's actually not a big surprise because realistically all we've done at this stage is add a larger diff cover that takes more oil but there's not really any additional cooling as a result of that diff cover. There are some fins on it but depending on how much air flow is getting to that diff cover we really weren't expecting miracles here. The more important aspect with that Cusco diff cover is that thanks to the two AN fittings on the cover it makes it really easy for us to add an external oil cooler. That's exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be fitting an external oil pump, plumbing that up to the diff through an oil cooler and this will be controlled via our Motec dash to turn the diff pump on once our oil temperature in the diff exceeds about 100 degrees C. Likewise with our new 6 speed sequential gearbox, our gearbox manufacturer has recommended that the oil temperature doesn't exceed 110 degrees C and this should be fine without an external oil cooler for sprint races where the races are no more than 4-6 to six laps but again for our use for endurance racing we already knew that we were going to need to fit an external oil cooler and pump and in this case we were seeing our oil temperatures in the gearbox reach a maximum of 109 degrees. We've been okay so so far, but definitely we're not going to be risking this for endurance racing. So there's the results of our testing. We've got some great results from our engine coolant temperature, but as with most things with race cars, we fix one problem and uncover a few more. So it's back to the workshop to get busy fixing our new problems. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.